Hi, I'm Chris McCarthy. I'm the executive director of the Provincetown Art Association Museum. I want to welcome everybody to our gallery conversation this evening with sculptor and collector John Ramundi, who is sitting to my right. Um, what I'm really going to try to have John talk about tonight is his background as an artist, but also how his making his own art has inspired him to be such a magnificent collector. One Sunday when I felt confident enough, I took my parents in um, our station wagon, and we drove up to Rockport on a Sunday afternoon, and I introduced them to the artists that I had met. And my dad had just one question to ask, and that was to these professional artists, do you think my son has what it takes to be able to just self-sustain himself? Uh, sustain himself. And in all cases, they said, look at him. He's a ping pong ball. He's bouncing off the walls. He loves what he's doing. Don't worry about him. He'll be fine. So that was what my dad needed to hear, that this was viable. I could make a living at doing what I was very excited about doing, drawing and painting. And, and then I educated myself very fortunately because of scholarships. And when I was in art school, um, uh, Oh, it's hard to explain, but my um, my wires are all crossed, so I can't read, and I see things upside down. And now they have words for those things. You know, it's dyslexic, and it's it, what is your ADH something? ADHD. Thank you, ADHD, and all this stuff. So um, back then, no one knew what to call it. They said he's not stupid, but how come he's reading the numbers and the letters backwards and all? So it was tough for me in high school. But when I got in college, um, right before going to college, I taught myself how to read because I'd never read a book until I was already left high school. And the first book I ever read was uh, Of Mice and Men. And then I read The Pearl, and then I read other beautiful things. It is a phenomenal picture for a number of reasons. And one of them is, you know, George was a great teacher and a, a, a marvelous artist. And a lot of the art that I happen to collect are artists, artists. They're not, they were not household names. They were never rich, like, Jack, um, like Jasper Johns or any of the, of the pop artists. But nonetheless, a very, very important artist, studied with Hoffman, as we all know. And I owned a larger picture of this, a uh, larger picture than this painting. And I wanted to buy a better one, because in my sense of collecting, I'm not collecting autographs after all. I'm collecting what I hope to be really stellar pictures by the artists. So I contacted him and had the great pleasure of meeting him at his studio and his daughter Helen, his wife had already passed away. And I was looking at a number of paintings in the studio and he was going to make lunch for us upstairs. And he interrupted me and said, excuse me, I don't understand. Can you tell me what kind of George McNeil you want? Now this is funny, when George McNeil was asking me that question, I said, oh, I want the best painting that you have done. He said, oh, that's easy. Helen, pull out your painting, Jezebel. And she said, well, I'm happy to show it to you, but it's not for sale. And he said, Helen, I'm serious. You're moving back from London now. This guy seems like he's the real thing. Take him in another room, get a good price for it, but sell him the painting. You could use the money. Don't wait till I die. Well, he had signed the painting on the canvas overlap after he finished it and signed it. This painting belongs to Helen McNeil. And then he redated it and he titled it. And the reason why he did that was he didn't want dealers that were coming into his studio at the time to sell this painting. And they couldn't sell it if they see that in the back. Even unscrupulous dealers can't do that. So she kept it so it could be exhibited, so people could see it but not be sold. And uh, it was never really exhibited in anywhere other than maybe very small group shows at artist studios. It was, it's never been in the gallery. So when I bought it from her, I just, I mean, it was just so, it was just so easy, so tough, such a strong picture, so confident. Mm. So that's why I was thrilled to have it in the show. And then, of course, the side of Klein, they knew each other, and Klein lived here in Provincetown. And this is 19, 
53. It seems like I have a lot of 53 things. By the way, I should say, I never thought, I never started off by saying, oh, I want to collect artists that were profoundly affected by the Cape. I never did that. It would be like saying, I want to collect women artists, or gay artists, or Italian-American artists. I would never, that's never been my intention. I want to collect art. I don't care who did it, I don't care if they're alive, I don't care what their religion was. So it was other artists that saw my aspects of my collection, like Gregory Amanoff, who said to me, and M.P. Landis, you have a great Provincetown collection. I didn't know that, because <laughs> I was looking a little more globally than, than that kind of thing. I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's just, that's just the reality of it. So, and this Klein, this gestural kind of things, and the marks and this, M.P. Landis right aside of me. I, when he sees this, he's going to faint.